Hello and welcome to the third part of this five-part seminar where I explore the theory and practice of parotheology. So in the first session, I looked at uh, a bit of the theory in relation to this idea of the freaked out fundamentalist and the hysterical God. And then in the second seminar, I looked at how that plays out uh, in a type of, in a group with ritual and with music. So what I want to do now is have a conversation with my good friend Barry, who is also someone who engages in radical theology and kind of like talk about some of the themes that have uh, come up in those two seminars. So Barry, thank you for joining us. Why are you in Belfast, by the way? Uh, I'm, I'm in Belfast because there's an event uh, happening here in uh, Crawford's Burn-In. Yeah. Some guy. Some guy. Doing a thing called Spark. Very good. But anyway, yeah, yep. so we're doing your annual event at the Crawford's Burn-In. Yep which is always um, a blast on so many levels and great people and great Some of whom are here. Yeah, we've got a little crowd today. Room. Yeah, good crowd, actually. And so after we've talked, feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, where do you want to take us, Barry? Well, so I, I looked at your last, uh, the last couple of weeks and I actually made lots of notes like a good, like a good school boiler. And uh, because it, it's, it's interesting to me, I, and I, I said to you um, earlier, off camera, that um, you know we've known each other for a long time, and over the years, I, I, I think things are starting to come into a, 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 a different kind of clarity now. And mm. a lot of stuff that that you've been discussing or um, and has been talked about over the last six or seven, probably ten years, it, it is really starting to coalesce into something. So it's quite. Um, I was excited when when I, when I listened to your your two conversations because it, it, it there there was a a kind of clarity in terms I think because I think one of the one of the interesting things that I noticed o over the years like one of the background things was yeah 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 theory theory but but how does this work and I think now you've sort of come to a spot where that's actually um, answerable in a, a sort of very tangible tangible ways and so I, I was kind of excited about that and there, there's so so much in in those last two conversations but one of the, and, and so I'll, I'll start with an easy one uh, or any e maybe an easy point but you made this um, connection between contradiction and grace and I, I wondered if you could sort of tease that out a bit more because the idea, the concept of grace, is such a big thing within confessional Christianity, and it and it comes with a certain amount, I think, of um, ideological baggage or interpretation about what it means. And I think what you mean by grace is something quite quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless I'm wrong. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it is funny you say about the clarity. I mean, I've been doing this work now for three yeah. decades, and it takes a lot of chewing to get to the point where you can have a very clear idea what yeah. you're doing and how to communicate those ideas. And uh, it's taken that amount of time. And so that's why I'm doing these, this seminar yeah, yeah. in many ways is to try to go right, um, taking all of that work and trying to kind of like uh, boil yeah. it down. Uh, yeah, uh, just really yeah. quickly too. I, I think it's interesting as well because there's so much pressure in the world in which we find ourselves to always deliver immediately on the you know give people the answer the how to the what you know yes. the what to do and and i think there's a lot of worth in taking time to sort of mull these things through so that what what you wind up offering isn't just a tweak yeah. of what's been which is actually, what, yeah. yeah. Which is what the university used to be. As like, yeah. you're able to take time out from making money, from yeah. having all of these other concerns, and for three years, like a monastic experience, for yeah. a few years, you can just think. Yeah. And it's very hard for us to to carve out that space, that desert in the oasis of our lives, where we can be quiet and think it's very difficult and i've al i've always said this that, that my work is a 500 year plan <laughs> so it's and i might not be around to see it completed but uh i'm going to be around for the first bit and the first yeah, yeah. bit has been 30 years of sure reflection I totally get it yeah um and then the grace thing right this is great so something and we're going to explore this actually at the event that we're running uh this week um 
I would argue that at the core of all of us is a question, is a wound, a kind of a, an unknowing. And to put a name to that, it is a question of what does the other want from us? There is this sense of when we're infants, we have a question of what is the other's desire? The, the, the thing that we want most is desire, the desire of the one we desire. So desire is, is so key to what it is to be human. And we don't know what the other desires, our mother and our father, the people around us treat us in various ways and we have to figure out why do they desire us? What do they want from us? And it's not as simple as they, them telling us. Yeah. You can have a parent who says, um, I want you to, you know, if a bully tries to bully you, I want you to tell a teacher. And that's the demand, they tell you that. But then uh, you do that and you feel the disappointment of your parents as if they would like you to have punched the bully, right? It's not what they said. Or vice versa, you punch the bully and they're disappointed, but secretly you think they're, they're happy, right? So there's all of these enigmatic signals. So at the core of us is this question why, this question of unknowing. Then we try to find answers to that and we try to figure that out. And we then build defenses um, and fantasies to help us answer that question. Now, in a nutshell, what and, and then what we do is we do self-help. We kind of like we kind of answer the question of what does the other want from us? Oh, to be famous, to be happy, to be wealthy, to be unsuccessful, to feel at everything, right? We we have these unconscious things of what the other wants, right? And some of them are bad, and we live them out. We don't know we're living them out, but but they kind of live them. Why why am I always dropping things, butterfingers, right? And I'm a timid person who's always breaking things. Well, maybe you're angry, and that's that that butterfingers is actually telling you unconsciously that there's an anger from the past or a questioning from the past. So we have all of these unconscious things going on. And, you know, self-help, as I say, tries to uh, help you get what you think what you want. Grace doesn't. Grace is the idea where you don't try to do anything. You don't try to move from A to B. You don't try to do anything except for sit and develop a curiosity with your own unconscious and begin to return to that central why question, that, that, that mystery that is at the heart of you. And as you're able to orient yourself to that question and make space for it and realize that, that you don't know what the other wants and they don't know what the other wants either because they're divided, that there is in the heart of all of us a type of unknowing that that encounter with that question is transformative is healing is mm -hmm. beneficial and so that's what i think grace does grace is basically you don't have to do anything but you in sitting you just have to accept yourself and by accepting yourself or accepting that you're accepted by others you're able to you're able to touch that dimension of yourself mm. which i think is important so just to sort of tweak that a little bit more so within Christianity, that would be quite often interpreted, oh, grace is this gift from God. You know, you're accepted by God. So therefore, you can accept yourself because God has accepted you. So how do you make a sort of, what's the distinction? Yes. So here's the, in terms of, I was talking to Steve, who's a psychologist. I mean, I figured we should talk about this oh, yeah. so that we can address the people who are sort of traversing that oh, yeah. bridge between perhaps a, a history or an experience of confessional Christianity and trying to work out how to make moves. The move, yes, and the, yeah, see how to connect these or not, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so what I would say is um, grace, I mean, AA is an example I've used yeah. a lot, but, uh, but to, to do a different interpretation that I maybe haven't said is, in AA, when you meet in a circle and you experience an acceptance. Now you may not accept that acceptance, right? You're sitting there because you've, you have to be there. Someone's told you, if you don't go and get help, I'm gonna leave you, whatever it is. You're sitting in a space and there's a group of people who are just saying, I'm an alcoholic, I have a problem. And you have the freedom to say it as well or not. So the circle goes round and for the first three weeks, you don't say anything, you just pass and it goes round. But then you start to accept the acceptance in the room. So there's this atmosphere of grace. And you, so you are accepted, but you don't accept that acceptance yet. 
But after three weeks, you begin to accept that acceptance. And then you're able to be honest, right? You're able to uh, express the problem that you have. Now, the interesting thing here is you're being accepted by others who have the same trauma and have the same issue and the same lack. So there's a sense in which you're both, con you're not being accepted by some father figure or mother figure who you imagine is perfect and wonderful and great. You're being accepted by someone who has the same unconscious as you and the same damage and all of that as you. Now, the reason then I want to push that further and say at the heart of what I do with parotheology is the idea that at the heart of everything, there is a type of wound, right? The heart of reality, the heart of mathematics, the heart of politics, the heart of the absolute. We can call this the heart of God, right? So in traditional grace, God is the substantive father figure or mother figure who accepts you from a place of perfection. But what if grace, in a sense, is where someone with this wound within them is accepted by someone else who has this wound. And we are unified and we are joined by the fact that we are marked by a question, a mystery. We are a mystery, not just like, I'm not just a mystery to myself, I'm a mystery to you. You're a mystery to me. What if you say that this wound is within the absolute itself? And so God is not just a mystery to us, God is a mystery to God. and. That is actually where the where grace comes from. That experience of grace is the experience of my lack overlaps your lack and overlaps the lack that is within everything. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. And so that's the difference between maybe a confessional grace, which is you're being for you're being accepted by some substantive non divided reality. Whereas I'm saying that no, it's more more like AA. Uh, grace is where we realize that there is you know, it's the difference is every religion, you're separate from some reality. You're either separate from God or you're separate from the veil of illusion separates you from ultimate reality. Hegel basically says that in Christianity, you're not just separated from God. God is separated from God. Yeah. You know, whenever Christ says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the same question. Why? What is <laughs> what is the ultimate answer? So there is no answer. And when you accept that, yeah. I, I believe that's a salvatory act that transforms your mode of being in the yeah. world. Yeah, yeah, great. Mm -hmm. um, so, to go, to jump on your your AA analogy, so mm -hmm. within the horizon of AA, there's a kind of uh, enacting of of the the heart of what it means to to be a part of AA to to how you you know, hi, I'm I'm Barry, I'm an alcoholic. You know, you go through your your steps, or, or you know, what it, the the ritualizing of, of their um, their understanding of the hu the human subject within your work, what's what's that for you? Like, what's the enacting of? Uh, uh, so, how do you live out this grace, if you like? Yes, like it, it communally, individually, both, and yeah, like yeah, both. Why not? Yeah, because yeah. So, I mean, this is the core of the work. Like, in terms of communally. What I believe is we need, well, we need music and we need art. Uh, we need ritual to draw us into these things. And we have lots of rituals that help us escape these things. So, you know, we have pop music. If you're depressed and you go out and listen to pop music and go and get drunk, those are rituals. And those are rituals that help avoid the anxiety of, of, of all these questions. And it gives you answers and you're, you, just fr you repress, you know, you deny the issues. What we need is we need rituals that don't help us deny or repress, but help us tarry with um, and dissect and ultimately bear the weight of our anxiety. Um, and so, and it, denial is an interesting thing. When you deny, so, when you repress something, what you actually do is the, the first Freudian idea of repression was you separate an idea from its affect. So something unpleasant happens and you push it down, you either forget what happened, the abuse, but then the affect remains and then it attaches to something else. So this is where people have emotional outbursts and they don't know why. Why am I so emotional about that advert on TV? Where, where did my explosion of anger come from? Why did I put that on you when you didn't really do anything? 
And you're like, you're at a loss because you know you're exploding with anger or sadness, but you can't really place where it comes from. Or other people, it's the exact opposite. They can talk about some traumatic event that's happened to them without any affect at all. You're going, why, why can you talk about that? But it doesn't evoke sadness. You know, that's a very traumatic event that happened. You see, so you kind of separate these two to survive and wor walk through life or whatever. Um, so in terms of individual life, good psychotherapy and good psychoanalysis is a type of ritual that helps you begin to put symbols, words to those difficult experiences to help you get closer to that wound. I mean, there's, there's a reason why analysts often sit behind you on the couch, right? Because what's that about is you're not looking at a person who's just like you. Yeah. Oh, they've got a certain color of eyes. Oh, they're married. Oh, they've got a wedding ring. They're this or that. In fact, you don't even see them. They're behind you. So they're, uh, they're a gaze without a look because you feel yourself being looked at, but you don't even see anyone <laughs> looking at you. And they mostly don't speak, so there's an absence of speech. It's not like there's, there's no one in the room, there's someone in the room who's refusing to speak, who you actually think should speak, right? You're going, why are you? And then very gradually, they become almost like an embodiment of this lack, of an embodiment of what's the dusting of the other, this unknown dimension of the other that you start putting things into. So that's a type of ritual, lying on the couch with someone behind you, that's individual. And then parotheology as a practice is using music and art and spoken word, storytelling, poetry, all of these things to help you very gradually uh, not defend yourself against the anxiety and the yeah. mystery, but begin to move towards it. Yeah, <laughs> I remember when, when I, <laughs> the first time I went to psychoanalysis and the, <laughs> the analyst, you know, is over here, I'm lying down, and you know, I'm English, so lying down in public <laughs> problematic on many levels, you know, and I'm in a room with someone that I don't know, and there's just silence, and it's so awkward at first. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's fear-inducing, mm -hmm. but after uh, after a while, there's uh, an immense <laughs> liberation, which I think is what you're sort of, to me, that one of the things that that I that I think you that you try and impress upon people is that this sense of lack is a, a very liberating notion once you can come to terms with it yes. and the challenge initially is to come to terms with you know what it takes what it takes to to get there that's it and, and i think no one can look at the face of lack and live right there's none of us live in that space like our defenses we're, we all have defenses so are you someone who always is humorous right and you're always making jokes Nothing wrong with that, it's brilliant, right? But you probably use that as a defense against issues, against looking at things, against uh, nothing. But if it becomes your only way of <laughs> interacting with the world, then it becomes a no problem. problem yeah. But all of our character uh, can be seen often as ways to protect ourselves, to create a barrier that protects us from encountering negativity, the negative, the lack. And what I'm interested in doing is how do we create a semi-permeable membrane where we can orient ourselves to this this fundamental question and lack within us. We can enjoy it because actually that's the site of all enjoyment and all suffering, right? And uh, if we're able to do that, I think we become. I say I, I think we enter into a new mode of being. We do yeah. like as, it's as strong as that, yeah. you know. Oh, and the name for this lack, right? This is the controversial bit. Uh, I think the name for this lack, it, the signifier for it is God. Sure. I, think, I think the signifier for the rift within everything, I just go like, there's a beautiful word for that. It's God because yeah. what's the theological notion of God? Omnipotent everywhere and ev in everything, and, and per but yet not existing, but not not existing, and kind of this eternal dimension of creativity, and all of this language that you would use to describe God yeah. kind of describes this fundamental rift at the core yeah. of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Lacan, you know, God is unconscious. And um, what, so I, th I think that sometimes people, will go all right so are you, are you just talking about 
mysticism? Are you just talking about negative, you know, apathetic theology? And and I think that some of the the roots of radical theology sort of lived there or or, or began there. But that's not really your particular take on yeah on th- or at least it's not the the end po- the end yeah. game right and this is why i mean I, i'm very happy about this right that virtually nobody who follows my work agrees with me on this and i really like that i really like that and every in the room probably there's even people laughing at the most things <laughs> is that, that that mostly whenever you have a speaker or something like that pe- the people who follow their work agree with them and there's also an identity marker why i agree with x and that's why i follow their work yeah. say 90% of the people who follow my work I don't think agree with me at, at the core of what I'm saying <laughs> because but still enjoy the interaction and I'm what, still in the what you do know. you think they disagree with and it's well this is at the core right and you can and you're allowed to disagree you're allowed to be wrong right but um, so, <laughs> um but where I think it's it's difficult for some people to go and I don't think you have to go where I'm going with this so that's the other thing I think you can I think mysticism can work right um but what i'm saying is often mysticism is or is is expressed like this i do not know the answer the answer is out there there is a substantive answer there is a wholeness a completeness there is a there is basically there was a wholeness before the fall and there will be a wholeness again in the future so that's the three part sacred and secular movement it's the same with capitalism secularism that you always generally have there was a previous golden age there you've got this is the crap bit and hey there's could be something mm-hmm. wonderful in the future whether the golden age was your past relationship your childhood or say a religious thing what i'm saying is kind of the fall comes first that there is something fundamental there's a rift within everything that causes us to fantasize a previous wholeness and then desire a future eschatological wholeness yeah. so for me there's no movement that <laughs> what there is is a kind of a realization of this fundamental rift within everything that then frees you from the idealization of the future and this idealization of the past. So in other words, what I'm saying is my, my, the signifier God for me is not a signifier for some substantive unknown reality, but is a signifier for a type of uh, unknowing that is in everything. So the universe is not deterministic. Yeah. There is at the heart of the universe a fundamental spontaneity or novelty. Yeah. 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 I, I yeah, really what do you think like, of that? Yeah. yeah. I don't disagree with you, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. Which yeah. Is well, we were, yeah. yeah. But, but I, I, I like um, Eugene Thacker's kind of take on mysticism, you know, in, in his book, The Dust of This Planet. Know, where which is made famous by do you want to tell that story very briefly because this is a guy who's not i mean he's just an academic wrote this yeah. book and was it who was it kanye west or uh, no it no, was jay-z uh, uh jay-z at uh well at an event he made uh, a des- i can't remember who the designer was but somebody put the name of his book on his jacket yeah and, yeah. Uh, and yeah and it became and, and also his work was uh partly in True Detective was one of the inspirations oh. for the writer of True Detective. But Eugene Thacker did a whole series of books on basically uh, l- um, the horror of philosophy. But in, in the book, In the Dust of This Planet, he sort of offers up a different kind of mysticism, which is not connected to the kind of traditional, the other end of knowing is not knowing, but it was a mysticism based in, in uh, the materiality of existence, the mm-hmm. dust of this the dust of life, really, yes. the dust of what it means to be human. That's the sort of mysticism that I can get my, my yeah. head around. Which you, know? you get in the deepest tradition. I mean, you get in Meister Eckhart. You get potentially in St. John of the Cross. You get So there's elements of mysticism that I think, and I've used the term in the first seminars, mm-hmm. you know, the difference between epistemological unknowing, yeah. which is the first type, which is I don't know, but there is a knowing, yeah. right? To ontological unknowing, which is, of course, there's stuff that I don't know, that I might one day know. Of course there is, right? That's mundane things. I can look on YouTube at videos. I don't know how to do something I can learn. But then also there is an inherent unknowability um, or quantum undecidability in everything. And Simone Weil's definition of God is basically that Mm -hmm. God is the quantum undecidability within everything. so yeah, but, I, but you don't have to, to go it's there. It's hard to put that in a song. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually, there's a I some songwriters. <laughs> there's a, I, I did a podcast the other week where yeah. um, they get a songwriter 
and you talk to the podcaster and the songwriter and the the thinker and then they go off and they write a song, write a song so yeah. they're writing a song about the podcast we did so i'm interested <laughs> to see what be, that's yeah. gonna be really good um, no. all right um, let me just look here at my little notes and see because there was so much do you do you want to talk about anything about why 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 it's not um self-helpy or have we, have we done that before? Right, I'll say a couple of words while you're looking in notes. It's just, that, I mean, I've, I've been pretty hard on self-help in the last few months in my stuff. And, um, there, but there is a place for it. it. But one thing I would say very simply is self-help works really well when you're not self-sabotaging. Whenever you have this semi-permeable memory and with, with these fundamental questions of what does the other want from me. Um, but it won't work if... You, are, you know, it won't work if you're not in that space. And Because most self-help is easy. I mean, there's virtually all of it is stuff that, like if you know you want to write a book, I can give you a self-help. You don't have to spend a grand coming to Ireland. I can go like, write 500 words a day and, you know, just keep doing that. That's a great piece of advice. It works really well. But the point is, I can't write 500 words a day. Every time I sit down to write, my mind goes blank. So I'm going, well, what enjoyment are you getting out of that? Why? Because, okay, so you're thinking about all these things and you're, you've got all these ideas, but as soon as you sit down, your mind goes blank. Let's analyze that. Don't try to do anything. I don't want you to try to write 500 words. I want to start asking, you know, why, why would your mind go blank when you sit down? Tell me about, and then free associate from there. Go, well, tell me about your family, your background. And you start to find something. And, and as you work that through, so I had a friend, this happened just last year. And it was uh, where a friend of mine is terrified of spiders, phobic of spiders. And she had a dream and she had a dream about spiders. And we analyzed it. We just sat down and talked about it and free associated. And it connected with her childhood, it connected with her father. And we did this analysis of the dream. Just all we did, just analyze the dream, forgot all about it. And then just about three months ago, I got a message from her and she went, I woke up and there was a spider crawling over me. Didn't bother me at all. And then about two weeks ago she sent another one saying yeah i actually killed a spider like she said i never had to desensitize myself i never had to do any of that she said i don't even know what we did when we did that dream analysis but it just shifted that's kind of how analysis works you go in and go i've got a problem with x right and then and then you never talk about it you go why am i talking about my family and relationships this is my problem but as you talk about this something becomes loose so, so grace for me is much more effective than self-help because grace is say you don't do anything. You just, act, you just look, accept yourself. You begin to see your unconscious enjoyment. Your unconscious yeah. enjoyment is so what you enjoy, but you don't know you enjoy. You actually maybe enjoy fighting or you enjoy you know, the things that you think you don't. And as you confront your enjoyment, you change your position towards it. Although I, I, I will say that the, the looking has to be be undertaken with a certain degree of forensic seriousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't just go, oh yeah, I accept myself as I am. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's a way in which you- It's always horrific, actually. Yeah. It's always yeah. horrific. It is horrific. Yeah, it's, that's why I said, actually, in one of the seminars, I said yeah. like, uh, this kind of enlightenment is never like, oh, this freeing and this wonderful thing, because you confront these these things that like for example this butterfingers that i said yeah that's an example where a person might go i am full of anger and i never even knew it i'm the most timid person i'm always so nice i'm always so kind <laughs> i'm always breaking things yeah because you want to break your mother's face you know you want to, you've got that anger but you've pushed it so far out that yeah. and, and actually that's horrible to confront you know um on a <laughs> confessional front i swear a, a fair amount I don't know if you knew that or no. not, but it has happened on occasion. But I didn't start swearing until I got involved in Christianity. Mm. And it was when I sort of had, I started to take a look at that that I, that I realized that there was this, you know, a buildup of a, a certain amount of frustration and resentment about the, the kind of um, pressure, the performance pressure to be an act as a certain person in the name of liberation from all the pressures of uh, uh, of so the uh, swearing became a kind of release this kind of like sake, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. but yeah um wow that's fascinating so how um so then 
let's just say somebody uh, wants because one of the things that I th that that I think is is really uh, important, uh, and we've we've talked about this I think over 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 the years is um, there are, there are I'm oh. I think that, that Are you might giving me mic technique? <laughs> I am. <laughs> you know, you can still learn a thing or two I, from that's me. True, yeah. That's true. It's true. Like yeah. where the light comes in. Yeah. Um, th there, I, I, I think, for me, uh, I, I think this. I don't know if "works" is the right word, but the whole notion of, of, of this whole way of looking at life only works if you dive into it in a, in a real way. I think it, it, there's, there can be a tendency for a lot of people to try and enact this stuff in pre-existing environments where a little bit of radical theology comes in, but then the general tone of things stays, remains the same. Mm. And, I, and, and I wonder um, what, what you would say about how somebody might begin to fashion something like this because on one level you go oh you know well, I've got music I've got words I've got art so but there is this this core of understanding that that you it would seem that you would need in order to really make this come alive maybe I'm wrong I don't yeah, know uh, courage I mean it, like, yeah. you need a lot of courage to yeah. do this work and Kind of, it's the re I mean, one of the reasons why I'm interested in this in terms of a, what I would call a communion of yeah. the contradiction. Because, and I like the word communion. I think I mentioned this in the last seminar. Community is usually formed or formed around shared identity mm. and shared beliefs, shared enemy, right? Whereas a communion is a group who are gathered together around a shared lack. So c the ultimate communion is the death of God, right? So you, uh, rem the remembrance of the death of God. So a communion is like, oh, what unifies me is not that we have the same language in common, the same gender in common, whatever. What unifies me is that we are both divided subjects. Like ultimately, I am a divided subject and you're a divided subject. So that's what I mean by communion. And I believe that this is such hard work that we either need therapists to do it to help us with it um and or we need art and music and a, and a weekly thing you know something we come back to to remain faithful to this because even if you we all do this at times in our lives we are all we all sometimes catch ourselves on so for example you might be a person who tends to deny things so you tend to be in a relationship but you pretend everything's fine even though you know it's not or you might be a type of person who idealizes things you tend to idealize people or events or you might be the type of person who has reaction formation so you tend to like do the exact opposite of what you are you look like you really love yourself when you hate yourself like most people who seem to think so much of themselves generally hate themselves and so you've got all these defense mechanisms we all have those mm. but but as we have the courage to look at those and become aware of which defenses we use, what our go-tos are, and we see that they protect us from anxiety, right? And we allow ourselves to feel that anxiety. Anxiety is always connected to lack, to this nothingness, to this whatever. So we allow ourselves to orbit this mystery, this unknowing of who we are and who we are to the other and who the other is to us. As we do that, we'll still do the same trick. We'll still idealize sometimes, but we'll be able to sometimes make jokes about it, or we'll have a shorter spa span of, of falling for it. We'll be able to per get, get a better purchase on it. Um, so, But it takes courage. Yeah, I don't know if it takes understanding, but it takes courage, and it takes community, and it takes uh, time. What, do you th what, what would you say, you say would be key things that people need to understand about pyrotheology in order to uh, generate a communion if you like like what yeah. like yeah so obviously lack mm. at the core mm. central thing for 
your take on things. But how, I mean, how much Hegel do people really need to read? Yes. <laughs> you know, or, yeah. or yeah. you know, how much Lacan or yeah. psychoanalysis? Well, to actually set one of these groups up. Yeah. Like, uh, what do you think? Yeah. No. I and don't I mean, think, I don't know. There's no formula. But, yeah. But, but but what's your yeah. uh, like your gut feeling about that? Yeah. I mean, I un, in an unpopular sense, I would say that. It requires a lot of work, yeah. <laughs> not to go to these groups, yeah. not to even. But to, if you want to, if you want to set something like this up, I and and it's partly people like us our responsibility to set up places where you can go and train. Like I do think training is important. I think it's, yeah. and that's what I've been doing for putting up so much content. Yeah. Um, so because it's easy to fall into traps, yeah, and so for the people who are maybe trying to set this stuff up um i, I yeah it's, it's how much training how do, i mean I'll, I'll also i just want to say do it i've got an anarchic dimension just go and do it but what often happens is it gets fitted into this new wine gets put into the old wine yeah. skins and um you kind of have as i say often a kind of like hey we don't have the answer but the answer is out yeah. there whereas this is slightly different yeah. also belief oriented yeah. a lot of people still go, where does belief fit into this? You'll yeah, notice course. I never talk about yeah. belief. Like I'm talking about how do we orient ourselves mm -hmm. around a fundamental yeah. rift within ourselves. Yeah. Like, yeah, so it's, you know, it's not. No, 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 because I, I remember, you know, what, what we used to do in, in LA, you know, the, there was always that, the tension of dealing with where well, somebody comes in and they go, well, you know, what do you people believe? Or, you know, where does this fit in? You know, there are those complications that, that come along. I, I, I think you're right. I, I, I do think it, it does take um, a, a, a certain orienting towards something. Yeah. But anyway, well, I don't know. There's so many things to go down. Yeah. One thing, how are we doing? We're doing maybe 10 more minutes and then we have a couple of questions. Are we actually, you guys will get lots of questions over the next five days, so I don't think we need to do that. <laughs> so keep doing you. You get no questions. Yeah, you get no questions. Unless, well, no, I'll give you a couple, okay? But you are getting us for like five days, so. <laughs> Yeah. Um, oh, it's funny. I wrote that down there. That's my response. It has to be a whole piece. It can't just be, or it remains a fetish. Uh, all right. Yeah. Anyway, um, talk to me about subjective destitution. Oh, yeah. Well, you know. I, I don't yeah. know why the imagery of that just seems to fit with every medieval painting I've ever seen in my yeah. life. But I love the term. There's yeah. some philosophy terms that are rich. You know, some are just annoying, some are rich. Subjective destitution, Lacanian term that has a lot of richness, a lot yeah. of depth. I mean, at a superficial level, the way I described that in the last part of the seminar was um, that that's why I was saying like enlightenment is painful, that there's there's a sense in which, you know, confronting oneself and confronting one's unconscious is devastating and is difficult and requires a lot of work. And so in, in some respects, that's what that's how I think of that term, mm. that in psycho psychoanalytic sense or in the power theological sense. There's a certain whenever you realize that there is the thing that you think will fix everything doesn't fix everything. That is, I mean, for me, that's the crucifixion moment, right? So in in Christian terms, you have, uh, you know, you have the Temple of Jerusalem, right, which is like the replaying of the Garden of Eden. You've got this Holy of Holies. That's where God is. You've got this massive curtain, and then you've got the Court of Gentiles where you can hang out. And we're all separated from the Holy of Holies. Uh, that's where wholeness and perfection is and then at the very moment of the crucifixion my god my god why have you forsaken me the temple curtain rips we see inside the holy of holies and there's nothing there right for me that's the experience of you get the money you get the job you get the partner you get the thing that you think will work and it's just doesn't it's just like you're still just as divided as you ever were that's subjective destitution that's crucifixion that's the nihilistic heart of conversion i think but then what arises after that is that's the failure and success. The success and the failure is when you realize that the not having is where all the enjoyment is. So you, you lose the sacred object, but you find the sacred as the depth dimension in all objects. And the sacred here, so the sacred as an object, what that means is there's some object that you think that car, that person, that's the thing, right? And that's the sacred object which exists until you get it, and then you realize it doesn't exist. It, um, it seems it's all in, encompassing. It seems infinitely valuable till you get it, and then it's not. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, it takes up all your attention. 
But then the sacred as a depth I mention is the idea that everything um, has a type of lack within it. Mm-hmm. And that lack within everything is what makes everything shine. Right. Yeah. So it's it's from idealization to sublimation. Idealization is something as amazing as but only insofar as it's at a distance. You can only fancy that person as long as you never go out with them. Sublimation is where you they in their imperfection are incredible. And that's what love is. I mean, ultimately you could say love is when you are oriented to the mystery that is the other and that they are oriented to the mystery that is you when you even the most familiar person to you who you've known for 40 years if you can still look at them and go there's a mystery to you you know you could destroy me you could do something that would completely surprise me because everybody can do that and that's terrifying and also that's appealing and you remain open to that dimension of the other and they create a harbor for that dimension in you think that is what love is whereas lust is a a list of characteristics that you want Mm -hmm. that will make your life more substantive and more complete which is what we all want that's why none of us want love you know because none of us in a sense want to realize that i'm incomplete and you're incomplete and yet love is where as i say i provide a harbor for that dimension in you and you and me that's for me is the secret which arises through subjective destitution yeah, it's yeah, it's interesting because um, interestingly, I, I I think that that notion has lived for quite a long time in in the realm of the arts because I think there are very few artists that you come into contact with who don't have a sense that the imperfect and the and the limitation. I mean, I I think there's the interesting thing is that. The, the, for me, the countercultural dynamic of the, the realm of the arts is that it accepts the the beauty of limitation mm-hmm. and the, the the gift of imperfection. It's what actually pushes you, if you like, or impels you towards not becoming whole or becoming perfect, but to live with your within the the horizon of yep. your limitations as a human being and yet find a fundamentally rich existence in the expression of that yeah. limitation. I, yeah, one of, one of my favorite artists is Barnett Newman mm. and his 12 Stations of the mm. Cross, which yeah. people can look up, um, are fascinating, very abstract. If you look at them, why are they called the Stations of the Cross, right? <laughs> and he wasn't even going to name it that at the beginning. They're just lines. <laughs> um, but there is this interesting, some of the lines are made by he he puts some masking tape on the canvas and paints over the masking tape and then peels the masking tape off what you have is this line that is does, doesn't exist it's a negative space it's a negative space in the canvas that connotes a kind of sublimity there's this kind of you know this very straight line that's going from like heaven to earth right um but it, I think it's a beautiful expression of this is like this negativity within the not within the world that um, doesn't exist but insists continues mm. to insist. Th- this is my problem with kind of like obviously reductive materialism yeah. is it is like you don't have to be a substantive spiritualist to say that there is an otherwise to being. I yeah. mean, my favorite example of, was one of she's ex is he goes to see a movie, which is good. But it seems like there's something missing and it's based on a novel. So he goes and reads the novel and that's no better. In fact, it's even worse. And it really feels like there's something missing. And so the the two concrete things create the illusion or the sense that there is a third document mm. that doesn't exist, but it insists <laughs> that, yeah. that, it, that and that is, the, uh, you know, that's object A. That's the that's that's something that's very, very powerful. It doesn't exist in a in a in a sense that the film and the yeah. the book exists, but yeah. it insists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. The insistence. The insistence, yeah. 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 Which is, you know, similar to the postmodern John Caputo, but yeah. a little bit different yeah, as well. Yeah, a little different, yeah. yeah. Might try and sum up. I mean tell <laughs> us where you tell us where you're going. Yeah. I mean we got to I think the nub, which I always get a bit nervous about because for a couple of reasons. One is this work is effective precisely insofar as you think it's going to work in one way and then it works another, right? Um, so you often go to analysis because you think that it's 
actually kind of like self-help well, it's going to help you achieve something it's <laughs> exactly, going to help you get yeah. something and and then you realize it's not doing that and it's not i mean I, i've one example of me when i did an analysis many years ago i you know was doing analysis it was fine but there was one day i was traveling back to belfast and i just thought it was a bad idea and i was coming back to see someone i thought ah should i do this or should i not and i was like said to my analyst like i know you never give advice i know that's not what this is and we talk but you know like here's like like should i go back or shouldn't i just wanted like you know come on and he was like you know well you know have you had any dreams lately like, just what oh, for goodness sake like just tell me something you know but what he was doing was going like that's not my job to give you advice to which either you know you'll you'll resent me for or you'll treat me as a father figure i'm not treating you like a child i don't want to say you, you know but i'm asking you about dreams because i'm asking what is this this is causing you anxiety this is causing you let's analyze that let's do that um but you know, you, you wouldn't pay for that. You know, people are coming to Spark to basically for me to make them miserable. If I told them that in advance, they wouldn't have come. I have to kind of pretend they're going to have a good time before I plunge them into despair, you know. <laughs> um, so it's like, it's so in some respects as well, when, when people come to a group um, that's exploring these ideas, we, we kind of want saved. And what we're talking about is a type of salvation from salvation. And we're talking about a type of, uh, looking at oneself, experiencing yeah. that grace where you're able to to look at those difficult parts of yourself and make space for them. Uh, you know, like that's a hard sell. But the easy sell, I don't know, yeah, is it a hard I sell? See, I, no, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't actually <laughs> think it is a hard sell, really. Yeah. yeah. I, I just think it's it's not the usual sell. Yeah. And and so you have to deal with a certain amount of expectation. Yeah. But and also, but I think there's a groundswell, yeah. and people come people come to it through having crisis usually. Yeah. Like so, that's the thing. Like people come to this work not usually when they're young, and uh, but often when they're going like, well, I thought everything I was going to be great, and then the divorce happened, or I got ill, or something happens that, that, and then and then you and you briefly look and go, oh my goodness, I've been defending against anxiety through maybe concrete beliefs or whatever yeah, and so yeah. and then you go yeah i am ready for this yeah uh, well you know and we also live in a world that constantly and continually affirms concrete responses to situations and circumstances that don't deliver yeah and eventually you you i think can come to a realization that that, that there's something wrong in in the, in the very structure in, of that in, in yeah. the very structure of that and that can begin to send you on uh a journey of exploration. I mean, you say, you know, plunging people into despair. I, I, I don't actually think I know anybody that doesn't have despair. Yeah. It's just that we have very few outlets for honest conversation about about that without someone saying, oh, you should. Yeah. Or, you know, or going down the usual line of fixes I know and the secret that I don't like telling people is is that you, you know, don't know what you're talking about I do yes <laughs> yeah there's that. I definitely <laughs> don't like telling people that but is that when you go to that darkest place you actually realize it's not dark at all it's full of light like but you kind of almost have to have the courage to go into the pit of your darkest stuff uh, but it's you realize oh it's only really dark because I never went there yeah. and I because I because that pit I kept the door on it and it seemed terrible and I could never open it and then I opened it and the monsters were actually quite friendly yeah and and actually I can I can not only cope with this but this makes me a better person and yeah. I'm actually enjoying life a lot more you know but yeah. it's almost like in order to find your life you have to lose your life so you, you kind of have to you have to have the courage to die and then yeah. but then you find out that the death is life 